So let's talk more about digital forensics and um, uh, maybe a little bit of e-discovery at the end, but what are the most common mistakes you think private investigators, attorneys, fraud examiners make when they're trying to obtain digital evidence? Yeah, so the most cop, um, common mistakes that I've seen is uh, people generally think that to make a forensic copy, it's a simple cut and paste um, out of Windows. So, you know, you may be um, meeting with your client, they may show you the computer, and they may say, all oh, my stuff's here. Okay, let's just make a copy of it. I, I brought a thumb drive with me today. And if they do that, the dates and the times, they change on the files. Um, there's, you know, that metadata associated with the files can change. Um, and just in general, you're, you're stepping on, you know, potential really important information, depending on the nature of your investigation. Um, there's also a lot of times when people think that forwarding of email messages is also appropriate. So let's say, you know, somebody received an email from somebody. Now it's a big part of the case. Hey, I'm going to just forward this to my investigator. I'm going to forward this to my lawyer. When you do that, um, it's generally speaking okay because email messages are in a container essentially. They're in an MSG, a PST, an OST. They're always in some kind of container. But the challenge with that is you lose the context between you know that whole thread um, of messages around that period of time if there are more. But it's always good to collect you know within a date range. Um, and not do these individual forwards. Um, it's also not good for chain of custody as well uh, when you do that because you want to have a documented and structured approach. Um, the other thing that uh, always happens is calling upon the expert that needs to come in too late. So you already kind of you know uh, thought about this. People think about you know the the value add of a forensic examiner coming in or an investigator, and what does that mean? And essentially, the challenge there is you want to engage people relatively soon when investigation kicks off so that all the relevant information can be kind of preserved, you know, collected in the most, you know, defensible and efficient way. Yeah, um, I know it's so interesting uh, in the world of forensic accounting, I kind of feel the same way about being involved a little too late in the game sometimes, yeah. or, and maybe not, well, yeah, sometimes too late in the game. Uh, and just, it's like, oh, if only we'd been hired a little sooner, not at the very end of discovery, we could have helped you obtain additional information that would have been good for your side of the case. So yeah, yeah, I completely and, understand that. And a lot of the organizations that you and I belong to, you know, the, we have a good network of, of special specialists in different areas, right? So it's a matter of knowing to leverage those relationships that you have and the, the resources that become available with a lot of those organizations. And, and I've become more and more familiar with the different specialties, even within the PI realm, mm -hmm. uh, to know that there are other experts out there and it's okay to reach out and to have them on speed dial and to really build good relationships within your network with people so that this way, there's, you know, a trust factor that goes beyond just looking somebody up on Google or, you know, through other methods. Yeah, for sure. So what are some reasonable expectations? If I'm a client of yours, what are some reason reasonable expectations from digital evidence collection? And I'd like to go through four of them kind of individually. Sure. So I, I'm asking this question four times. Yeah. Uh, so first, what's a reasonable expectation uh, from digital um, Reasonable expectation from digital evidence collection as it relates to email. Okay. So um, we kind of touched on email before when I was saying, you know, don't forward. The, the reality of, of email is uh, we've gone away from everything being right in front of you. So your, your servers, your ability to pull directly from, let's say, uh, the, the systems that everybody's accessing and went from being on-premise to now being up in the cloud, right? So email collections can take time, um, you know, and that's one of the things that it's beyond our control now because we're relying on Microsoft, we're relying on all these different providers to basically search and, and export, uh, allow us to export, um, you know, that data. Um, I think also 
that uh, retention policies need to be thought about. The fact that you know some businesses don't uh, retain email for a very long uh, period of time. Emails, you know, still very much used. There's billions of emails transmitted, you know, and, and uh, exchanged every year. So a lot of times the burden of the the organization to keep those messages for an extended period of time um, can cause people to, you know, delete emails and that becomes somebody's habit. And if there's no retention period or a legal hold in place, as we call it, then those emails can be gone. Um, and, you know, and there may be spoilation that becomes an issue down the road in court cases. But I mean, email expectations right now is that uh, sometimes, you know, you, you may uh, find that the email is no longer there, um, that if it is there, that um, you want to just be a little bit conscientious about how to collect email. Sometimes a lot of my clients want to get down to the specific emails of interest to do a very targeted collection. I always say do a date range based collection versus a keyword based collection because certain documents don't actually allow you to search them. They're non-searchable, they're non-text based. Um, you know, sometimes people scan in PDF documents. Well, those are just PDF documents, they're images. They don't have the, the text associated with them. So there's a lot of caveats there with email. So if someone has hired you to help them preserve emails and do the search on that, do you provide uh, the hosting platform for them to search that? Or are you collecting, preserving it, and then they have to find a way to open it or review it? Yeah, so the, the end of the, the road for email is typically in a document review platform. So we essentially get it back um, you know, to our lab, we extract out the data, uh, and then we put it into a uh, data processing engine review platform uh, that then basically extracts the email messages, associates the attachments, and allows for review, the, the tagging, you know, and, and association, and, and obviously further down the road, the, the production of that information. Okay, great. <laughs>